So um, before we get started with the throttling and affinity discussion, I just wanted to share a couple slides um, that kind of just relate to a bunch of different protocols that we talked to about talked about um, this week. So um, for anybody new, again, my name is Matt Steele. I'm a, I'm a consultant in our um, premier partner services organization. So I'm on the services side rather than the product group side. Um, I work with a lot of partners kind of across this spectrum of um, exchange development topics, many different workloads, many different APIs. Um, and so I, I get the perspective of partners like yourself um, who have to support multiple versions of Exchange, understand the different APIs for these different workloads in Exchange, and kind of navigate your way through. Um, so this slide is, is a slide that I use a lot when talking to partners just to kind of um, illustrate that the story is getting simpler uh, from, from an API perspective, from an interoperability and integration perspective with Exchange. Um, and just to show over these different workloads that we have, some of which we've talked about um, this week, some of um, all of which are, are discussed in various protocol documents, um, you know, kind of where we're going. And you can kind of see this clear picture evolving from an from integration perspective, um, centering around EWS, um, PowerShell. Down here in Transport, we have managed transport APIs. And this is uh, Forefront Online Protection for Exchange. Um, in, uh, in Exchange Online. And then the mobile mailbox access, obviously, is, is kind of always been Exchange Active Sync. So um, EWS, even uh, WebDAV, obviously, the MAP ERPCs, um, EAS, obviously, all of that is in the protocol documentation. Um, but I just kind of wanted to share this slide in, in hopes that it kind of brings all of that together um, from a uh, product version standpoint. Then another slide which I wanted to share here because it will relate kind of to our discussion about throttling and, and affinity is just kind of um, just to, to illustrate. I talked um, a fair amount in the, in the previous uh, sections uh, about uh, CAS servers, client access servers versus uh, mailbox servers and a database availability group. Um, mm -hmm. I talked a lot about um, RPCs, counts, and latencies and things like that. So this just kind of illustrates um, what you'll find in a typical exchange uh, deployment, what protocols are being communicated between a particular client um, and exchange, and how that relates. So um, from an EWS standpoint, um, we've talked about Outlook, um, whether it's inside the firewall or outside the firewall, um, using EWS and RPCs. Um, this Azure icon would, you know, um, is just signifying any kind of application server using EWS. Um, talking through a, a load balancer um, to a CAS array, so an array of Exchange client access servers. Um, and then we'll talk a lot about, uh, we, we've already talked a lot about the RPCs that go between the client access servers um, and the mailbox servers on the back end. Um, we also have LDAP RPCs that, that go between the uh, client access server and the domain controllers, global catalog servers, et cetera, in the environment. Um, so you can see that whether it's MAP ERPCs, ActiveSync, EWS, that all goes through the CAS array. That all gets communicated to the back end via RPC. Um, so if you're not familiar with kind of that architecture, it will relate to what we talked about today um, and what we talked about yesterday. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of point that out, make sure that was clear. Are there any questions about this slide or the one before that before we get started? Sure. Would you include public folder access on there? Um, so a public folder server would be would be down here, and it would be essentially the same thing. You're going through the uh, through the CAS server to the public folder server, I believe, instead of directly to it. As I, as I drop my mic here, um, in Exchange 2007, that might have been different. So in ex this is also to point out this is this is Exchange 2010. So in 2007, the MAP ERPCs go to directly to the mailbox server. They don't go through the CAS server. Um, Matt, where does, uh, where does OA sit in this picture? So uh, the question was, where does OA sit in this picture? OA is on the client access servers. And so there's, there's RPCs or EWS um, calls uh, happening in OA at the client access server level back to the mailbox server. But the, all the EWS traffic, all the all the communication between the CAS server and the back end mailbox servers is via RPC. And again, this is this is Exchange 2010 that we're talking about. Here. Right. So 
So back to the topic um, at hand. So we're going to talk about today is throttling infinity. Um, so this is, again, this is kind of going beyond the protocol documentation. This is implementation details. Um, this is how uh, Exchange works, how we recommend that load balancers be configured, how that affects your application, whether it's an application looking at communication over the wire. Um, this would be important to understand um, how, how, from an infinity perspective, what you need to make sure is maintained over the wire so that the client maintains the appropriate affinity to a CAS server as needed. Um, if you're looking at building a service, a high scale service application that's talking to Exchange, both these topics are the key to achieving scale, uh, speci specifically with Exchange Online, um, where we have um, a lot more volume, uh, throttling is a bit tighter, um, you can't just lower throttling settings, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, and then maintaining affinity um, or making sure you get properly load balanced is going to be equally important. So we'll start out talking about throttling and then we'll get into affinity. Again, um, if you have any questions throughout this, just feel free to raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll take them as they come up. So um, in Exchange 2010, um, we have um, throttling policies that cover various different protocols. So it covers everything, PowerShell, OA, MAPI, RPCs, POP, IMAP, EWS, EAS, um, <coughs> et cetera. So um, the, the, you know, here's just a quote from, um, from TechNet under uh, understanding the client throttling policies and, and the goals behind them. Um, so, you know, it kind of boils down to protecting the infrastructure. So whether it's a malicious client, um, whether it's just a client that's not interacting efficiently with Exchange, um, for whatever reason, um, we have these client throttling policies in place to protect the health of the system. Um, and so one client behaving badly can cause another client to get throttled. Um, one client behaving badly can cause itself to get, to get throttled down. Um, so it's all about maintaining the health of the system. We have, um, in Exchange 2010, we have default policies that are applied to all users. So there's a default policy set that's applied to every <coughs> user um, right out of the box. You can customize the throttling policies. So you could, you could one off a throttling policy for one specific user or a group of users. Um, this may be more or less restrictive um, in Exchange 2010. Um, in Exchange uh, Online, that's not an option. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then um, an interesting note here, and actually there's a good article on uh, the Exchange dev blog about fallback policies. Um, <coughs> policies are stored, um, well, I guess, Policies are associated with the mailbox. You can have a service account that has no Exchange mailbox that makes, uh, that makes EWS calls. Um, the fallback policy is in a situation where because the ser you know, a service account or any given user that's making um, any one of these uh, calls via protocol, um, because it doesn't have a mailbox, we can't associate the default policy with that mailbox. So there's a hard-coded fallback policy that applies to any account that doesn't have a mailbox associated with it. Um, and so that, that applies to Exchange 2010 and Exchange Online. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about you know, how much you should care about if you're writing a service application modifying throttling policies. So, um, so, so basically, uh, there's a couple notes here um, about some recent changes in um, Office 365 Exchange Online. Actually, this first bullet is, is incorrect. This last bullet is correct. Um, so um, in off, right now, in Exchange uh, Online and Office 365, we have, um, we ma basically make, maintain two copies of the throttling budget. So we'll talk about what each of these throttling settings are that impact an EWS application. Um, the, um, in Exchange Online, we have, a, we have a change where we maintain two separate copies um, of a budget. So we have one we would call the interactive budget, and that's for the client um, or the user act, accessing their own mailbox. So I log in as Matt Steele. I'm accessing my own mailbox. I get um, the throttling policy settings for myself. There's a separate copy, what we call the non-interactive budget, and that would be a service account that's impersonating Matt Steele accessing that, uh, my mailbox. So 
if there's a service out there that's monitoring my mailbox, say for an archive scenario or backup or um, you know some kind of unified messaging integration, um, and they're maintaining, we'll look at things like the max concurrency limit. So they're maintaining connections to my mailbox. I'm not going to get locked out of my own mailbox because there's a you know, service or a number of services monitoring my mailbox as well. Um, so we have this change uh, in place in Exchange Online today. Uh, it's coming soon for Exchange 2010 SV2. Um, and, and it's a significant change if you're writing an, uh, an Exchange uh, Web Services service application. Um, it makes it very important to use impersonation uh, rather than delegate access or direct mailbox access um, when you're accessing mailboxes. So the note here, you know, just to, to emphasize that, an application which uses delegate access, so that's um, if I have a service account, um, and we, we looked at that yesterday in Venkat and uh, Daraji's presentation, which uh, delegate access is where I say, I want to access a mailbox as this service account, um, but I want to access Matt Steele's inbox versus I'm actually impersonating Matt, Steele's, uh, Matt Steele to access an inbox. So um, those would not be charged on the non-interactive budget. Those are actually going to affect the, uh, the, client, the client budget, the interactive budget. So um, Exchange Online, Exchange 2010 have slightly different default policy settings. Um, this isn't, this is just a screenshot in, in, in time of uh, actually WinDiff comparing um, just the output of Git throttling policy. Um, I'd recommend that you use Git throttling policy on both the latest update of Exchange 2010 versus the, um, the latest build of Exchange Online just to see what these values are. Um, for Exchange 2010, they're probably the same. Exchange Online, they might be slightly different now. Um, this is, I haven't updated this in a little while, but I would assume they're about the same. What is definitely the same is this difference between EWS Max subscriptions. So the red is Exchange 2010 SP1. Um, the yellow is Exchange Online. You can see this is a significant difference. We'll talk about what these policies mean uh, to your application or to any client um, in a little bit. But just note, for the most part, they're very much the same. There's some key differences that we'll get into. So getting right into that, EWS Max subscriptions. Um, so we talked a lot about yesterday. We talked about streaming notifications, push notifications, pull notifications. That first step where you create a subscription. This throttling limit is the number of active subscriptions that a service account can maintain on any given CAS server. So when we get to talking about affinity, another important thing to, to, to keep in mind here is that the throttling budgets are maintained on the CAS server. So when I have an array of multiple CAS servers, the budget and all of that is maintained in a rela relationship between the calling account and the CAS server. So if my calling account is interacting with one mailbox on one CAS server and another mailbox on another CAS server, then uh, I, get more, I can get more scale out of my app because the, the throttling budgets, um, you know, it, both those calls aren't impacting my uh, throttling budgets. So this is the number of active subscriptions on a given CAS server at one time. Um, as we talked about yesterday, a single subscription may contain multiple folders within that subscription. And so, um, you know, that's not, this budget isn't charged per folder, it's per parent subscription. Typically what we see, um, we talked about yesterday, um, when, we're, when we're going through and we're creating subscriptions at scale, uh, we're using, we make that first subscribe call. We're doing that through impersonation. Um, and then we do a subsequent get events or get streaming events call that gives us our events back. Um, because of the nature of that, typically one subscription is going gonna, is gonna to equal one mailbox. You're going to have multiple folders within that mailbox that you're subscri subscribed to or all folders. Um, so typically the value of, of this setting um, will relate back to um, the number of subscriptions that you have um, maintained for that for that mailbox. So um, the the implication here um, when we look at uh, previous slide here, so when we look at this, the the setting limit here is twenty versus five thousand. So 
the way 20 would read is that any given service account could only maintain 20 active subscriptions or monitor 20 mailboxes in Exchange Online. But the key to mitigating this throttling policy with the Exchange Online settings is to use impersonation. So if you use impersonation, your budget is applied to the non-interactive uh, budget of each individual mailbox, so you can scale out well past well past 20, because you're not charged, the service account's budget is not charged, it's the target mailbox that's charged in the non-interactive budget. And then if you have to, you can use multiple service accounts to mitigate this too, so you could, you could create one service account for the first X thousand mailboxes that you want to monitor, have another service account that monitors the next thousand or so. Um, so that's how you achieve scale um, with, uh, within this EWS Max subscriptions policy. Again, the Exchange Online throttling policy settings aren't configurable. So as a tenant admin in Exchange Online, you can't file an ops request to, to have that changed. You're, you are basically stuck with the default policy settings. And that's because it's a multi-tenant environment and we're trying to protect the health of the overall system and the multiple tenants that are on the system. So. Um, next one related to uh, EWS is EWS fast search timeout. So this is just the, um, that query string, find item plus query string that we talked about yesterday. Um, and so you, can, you could write a, a, a query that maybe queries multiple folders, um, maybe does some complex calculation, or is a query in a folder with many thousands of items in it. This is just to make sure that the CAS server doesn't spin uh, for too long uh, trying to facilitate that request. So it's tracked per request that you make. So any one given request um, is, is, going to, is going to fall under this limit. Um, I think this limit is set, uh, if we look back, I think it's set pretty high. Um, so you have a minute, 60 seconds um, on the timeout for that. So it's not, it's not that restrictive. Um, Typically, these, these um, query string uh, find item calls are pretty quick, so it's not something that, that's really going to uh, affect you too much, at least not that I've seen with my work with partners. So um, one that does come into play here is the EWS find count limit. So we talked about find item yesterday, and I said always use an index page view to limit the number of results that come back. Um, this is just a throttling policy in place in case a client doesn't follow my guidance there, um, and they aren't using an index page view, and so they do a find item against a folder with 10,000 items in it and no page size. Um, we don't want to spend, you know, a bunch of CPU cycles on the CAS trying to return that, uh, trying to return that result set. So this is, this is a limit that's in place to protect the maximum number of items that can be returned from a find item or find folder, um, and that's not tracked per request, that's per tra tracked per active request. So if I have two concurrent find item requests that have result sets of 50 items, that charges 100 against my budget. And so that's in relationship, again, between the, the calling accounts, the service account, um, the mailbox it's accessing, and the uh, client access server that we're talking <coughs> about. So in Exchange 2010, if you're supporting the Exchange 2010 EWS schema, you'll actually get the allowable uh, number of items back in your result. So you, you won't just flat out give it, get an error in this case, like if we did these, uh, these two requests, there were 100 and then um, you know, maybe the limit set at 150, we made another one of these requests. Um, we would get the allowable results back and then when you go over a budget in Exchange 2010, you'll get a notification that, um, that you'll get this flag here, include last item in range will equal false. So you'll ask for 100 items, we'll give you back 50, and then we'll say, by the way, this doesn't include the last item in the range you selected. If you make another request um, with an offset, we'll give you the other 50. So it allows you to keep working within the, uh, within the throttling limit. So if that got changed uh, underneath you without you noting, uh, noticing, then uh, you'd still be able to go forward. Prior to Exchange 2010, you just get error server busy back. So you just get a just get a straight error message, uh, error code back, um, and then you'd have to uh, basically lower your uh, your page view or apply a page view and try again. Um, so the next ones here are really about protecting the health of the CAS server. So we have three different policies here. 
Um, the, these are examples of throttling policies that, um, in this case, I'm calling out the EWS specific um, iterations of them. Um, but there's ones for uh, MAP ERPCs, uh, for OA, um, all the other protocols. So this is the percent time in um, policy settings. And there are the percentage of time per minute. In this case, an EWS application can consume on a CAS within a one minute window. So basically what we look at is for a given application that's in this case using EWS, um, we're looking at the percentage of time um, and we'll kind of work backwards through this list. The percentage of time um, within a given minute that a CAS server um, is, is spending facilitating requests from that account. Um, so this, this last one is just the overall time the CAS is spending. Um, two of the RPC operations that a CAS server could do is make mailbox RPCs or directory op, uh, RPCs. And so these policy settings kind of break out um, that into into separate. So this this percent time in CAS is kind of an aggregation of both of these. It's always going to be greater um, than these two values. And so when you see the, the values in the policy setting and results, keep in mind that they're a percentage of time within a minute. So you're going to take 60 seconds times whatever percent value is in these settings to calculate how much how many seconds within any given minute you would have. Um, this, again, is, is not necessarily um, something that you have to pay really close attention to other than to fine tune the property sets and batch sizes that you're going to do anyway, like we talked about yesterday, uh, just to get the best performance out of your application. Um, in situations where the CAS server is struggling to keep up with the overall general workload, be it Outlook or OA users or something going on in the CAS server, um, this percent time in CAS for your request may go up because that CAS is struggling to keep up with its general workload. So that's an example of a, a case where you could get throttled here um, and asked to, to back off through that error server busy uh, response due to no fault of your own. It's just a transient problem that hopefully if you back off a little bit, let the CAS server catch its breath, um, it will, it will, uh, you'll then succeed. In some cases, you might just have an unhealthy CAS server. Um, and you, you get in a situation where you're, you're getting error server busy back um, because you know there, it's just under stress. So um, this is one that really, if you're following best practices um, and you're handling transient throttling conditions, uh, you'll be fine. Um, another one here, EWS max concurrency. So this is the maximum number of current connections um, that, can, that a specific user can have against an exchange server is using EWS at one time. So um, obviously, we, we talked about yesterday, EWS is largely stateless. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, about um, affinity and, and subscriptions and how they're kind of stateful. But um, you know, for the most part, unlike, unlike Mappy, we're not, we're not creating sessions uh, on a server. So this idea of a connection is kind, of, is kind of weird when we talk about EWS. But basically, it just means from the time that a request hits the CAS server to the time the response went out went out um, back to your client. So um, that that counts as a connection. So if you have multiple open uh, current requests that, that have hit a CAS server, um, if you go over this max concurrency limit, um, again, you'll get, uh, you'll get throttled. Um, and again, this applies to, when we use the impersonation header, this applies to the target mailbox, not the service account. So we can go beyond the setting value here, which is usually um, 20. Um, max concurrency, but you, as a service account, if I'm making a request to 100 different mailboxes and impersonating all of them at one time, I would be fine uh, in Exchange Online with these, uh, with the impersonation uh, throttling settings. Um, so to mitigate this too, um, use use queues and thread pools to kind of control the maximum number of requests. Um, that's important because you might. In some, in some situations, be able to scale that up or scale it down. So you might have to keep a closer eye on this. Um, in Exchange 2010, uh, on premise prior to uh, prior to SB2 and these impersonation changes. Obviously, with Exchange Online, if you're using impersonation, you're going to get a large benefit. And then, just like Max subscriptions, you might have a situation where you just need to use multiple different service accounts so that you max out your connection concurrency limit uh, with one service account. Use another service account. Um, you know, to move forward. 
in a case of like subscriptions where I'm monitoring mailboxes, I may do that with one one service account that I use to monitor mailboxes and keep those open streaming event connections, um, and then use another service account to actually process and do the get item events or sync folder item events um, that come out of uh, those events I'm receiving. So that that's kind of the the ways that you mitigate um, and work around these throttling policies without changing uh, the settings. So just a couple other uh, policy limits, and so before we talk about these, the, the max concurrency limit, there, there's limits like that. Again, that's not EWS uh, only. There's other, there's a uh, MAP ERPC limits, um, max concurrency limits, et cetera, um, for the other protocols as well. These three policies also apply to any protocol um, per user. So uh, the message rate limit, number of messages per minute that can be submitted by a given user. Recipient rate limit, number of recipients that, it, that a user can address in a 24-hour period, and the forward E limit. So these are basically just kind of general limits um, that exist. You'll find them in Exchange Online and Exchange On-Premises. Um, and they, they could obviously affect your EWS app if you're using that to send out requests. Um, they, would, they would affect, uh, these would aggregate, I believe, regardless of the protocol to the user. So if you use if you're using MAPI and EWS or EAS to send out messages throughout the day, you could hit these limits um, through the aggregation of all the, the mail that you're sending uh, through the various protocols per user. Here's some of the errors that you would get back for these different throttling policies. So um, EWS max concurrency, you'll actually get a specific error response back explaining to you that that's the policy setting that, you, that you're running into. Max subscriptions, the same thing. You'll get a specific error response and the find item count or find count limit. You'll get a specific error response back. So when you see those errors, you know that, that you've run into the, those specific limits. For limits like the percent time in, um, you just get error server busy back. And in, in some cases, like with Exchange 2007, um, you might just get error server busy back. There's other, there's other scenarios where if the Exchange server can't facilitate your request in a given time, you may get that error server busy back. Um, the key there when you see that is that that's typically a transient throttling condition. So you don't want to you don't want to reset you know resend your request immediately. You kind of want to back off and let it let it catch up. Um, but you should expect that you know with some time that you'd be able to recover from that. These cases might be more that you have to go back and look at what you're doing on your client or your service and say okay. Um, you know, I need to limit my, uh, my page size um, to get around this, or I need to back off my concurrent uh, requests that I'm trying to send. So basically some conclusions here about throttling. Um, throttling exists, the policies exist to protect the server and the resources. Um, your application shouldn't require changes to throttling policy settings, um, whether that's that's MAPI or EWS or anything. It's just not a good practice, specifically because once you try to support Exchange Online, you're, you're not going to be able to, uh, to do that. So if for nothing else, you're going to limit yourself only to an on-premises deployment. Um, as an application uh, developer, I, you know, I should try not to be throttled. So I should try to play nicely with Exchange, understand the throttling policy limits, work within them, um, use impersonation, manage CAS affinity, which we'll talk about in a minute use queues and batches to manage currency, um, but also recognize that even if I'm playing nicely, because there's other clients interacting with the, with the environment, I could very well be throttled um, through no fault of my own. So um, you know, we want to be able to handle transient throttling conditions and back off nicely instead of if you get error server too busy, don't add to the problem by immediately retrying your, your request over and over again. Um, so just those are just some final notes there on throttling. Um, any questions on that before we move to affinity? Sure. Yes. Why doesn't the cat simply uh, hold the connection and not do anything? Well, um, so the question is why wouldn't the CAS server just hold the request and, and not do anything? So basically hold the request and wait until things calm down and it can facilitate the request. So um, typically the problem there is that um, the, because it's a web service and, it's, and, and um, you know, we typically have the client is going to have a, a timeout limit of its own that it's waiting for. If it doesn't get a response, it's going to assume that something bad happened. So what we try to do is give you that error response back right up front. 
and just say, hey, I'm telling you up front, I'm too busy to handle this right now. And then you can back off and, and try again. Any other questions? All right. So moving on to affinity. This is all, um, this discussion is centered around EWS. Um, it applies to Mappy and EAS and various other protocols. Um, there are situations, different situations per protocol that um, you're going to gain efficiencies or run into scenarios where affinity is required. Um, and so what is affinity? Just to kind of uh, level set off, off the bat here. So we're talking about that diagram where I have, a, I have a CAS server array. So I have multiple CAS servers talking to multiple backend servers. Um, as a client, there's, a, there's typically a hardware load balancer or some kind of load balancer out in front of my CAS array. And as a client, I'm only really talking to that load balancer. So I just have an endpoint, you know, um, it, it might be mail.outlook.com. Um, but all that really is is a load balancer that's then handing my request or, um, to a particular CAS server on the other side of it to facilitate that request and send the appropriate RPCs to the backend mail server. So there's situations where we want to make sure that my requests from the client to just this kind of generic mail.outlook.com are getting back to the same CAS server because that CAS server is holding state information that's useful. Um, or in some cases required for the successful completion of my request. So we have documentation on TechNet about um, the, the configurations, um, exactly how to do this if you're an IT admin, how you uh, configure Affinity uh, on a load balancer for various different protocols. Um, for EWS, we're primarily going to focus on this cookie-based Affinity, and we'll explain that in depth. Um, and then, like in Exchange Online and Exchange On Premises, you might see that it would fall back to the SSL ID based affinity. So, if that cookie is not present, it, then the load balancer would be configured to use SSL ID affinity to uh, send any request with that same SSL ID to the, to the um, same CAS server. So, how does this affect uh, throttling policy management, or why does this matter? Um, two cases throttling policy management, and subscriptions. We'll talk about both. Um, so again, budgets are maintained per account. Um, and when I say per account there, um, remember we have these changes in Exchange Online now where the, the actual definition of which account, whether it's the calling account or the target mailbox, a, a service account is trying to access, is based off of that impersonation header. So it's maintained between the, the account and the CAS server. Um, so again, Managing affinity is going to help me achieve scale by spreading that load out to multiple CAS servers um, so that I can work within some of these throttling policies that we just talked about. Subscriptions require affinity. So we talked a little bit about this yesterday. I showed you where um, I did IIS reset on my Exchange server, and it dropped my uh, subscription. So those subscriptions are stored on each CAS server. So when I subscribe to a CAS server, that's the only place that my subscription lives. If I go, my request gets load balanced to a different CAS server, my subscription isn't going to be found, and the, my client's going to get an error back. So I need to, as a client, I need to make sure that when I subscribe to a mailbox and I get a cookie back, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm working with a CAS that my get event requests go back to that same CAS server. We'll look at this in depth. This TypeNet article here is the, um, is the configuration per protocol. So that covers EAS, MAPI, EWS as well um, for the uh, load balancing requirements for each protocol. So as an EWS or client, uh, client, my responsibility is to look for and intelligently use this exchange cookie value that I get back. So when I send an initial request to a CAS server, I don't have that cookie yet, right? So I just send a request. There's no cookie on it. Um, I get a response back, and that response back has that cookie. Um, and then I can choose as a client to return that, that cookie on subsequent requests, which will ensure that I get back to the same CAS server. Um, or I can not send that request, which gives me a, or that cookie back in my next request, which gives me a chance to end up at a different CAS server. So you're not directly managing which CAS server you go to. You're not, you don't know. Um, that cookie doesn't tell you anything about which CAS you went to and how many CAS servers there are. It, you just know that if 
For every request I send with a given cookie, it's going to the same CAS server if my load balancer is properly configured. If I don't send that cookie, then I may end up at the same CAS server, I may not. Um, you know, it, this last bullet, it's a good idea not to rely on SSL-based affinity or if there's like client IP-based affinity. Um, you don't want to rely on that because it's not manageable. We'll talk a little bit about when you want to build out scale. Um, these are more fallback um, affinity policies that, that would ensure um, a client that doesn't know um, how to manage affinity or isn't doing that um, is getting back to the same CAS server so that their state information is maintained if they're doing stateful operations in EWS or MAPI or something. Matt? Yep. Um, if you're using the managed API, do you still have this responsibility as a client? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and hopefully I address it. I think I have a slide coming up. If I, if I don't, I will talk to that. So the, the question was, does it, how does the EWS managed API help you? And, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So we have, so based on the, the, the previous notes there, we have two main goals as a client application. Um, and this, this is kind of with any EWS client, um, whether that's a service application or just a mail client based on EWS. So I want to firstly ensure affinity when it's required or, or creates efficiencies. We'll look at situations where I can create efficiencies through using affinity. Um, so there's times when it's good to send every request back to the same CAS server. The second thing we want to look at is in all of these other cases, I want to get I want to make sure that all the requests coming from, from my client or my application are getting balanced. The load is getting shared across all the servers in the array so that I can maximize my throughput. Um, so they're kind of contradictory, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of walk through how that works. Um, and I, I do think I, I, I'll come back to the managed API kind of as after we talk about, talk through this. So. Um, so what I've, what I've got here is just a, a, basically a, a graphic here for a number of different scenarios. Um, and we'll just kind of walk through them and I'll kind of hopefully illustrate um, how, you know, how this best practice works. So in this case, I have an EWS application communicating through a load balancer to a CAS array. There's three CAS servers. Um, these are two um, mailbox servers uh, here. So it'd actually be like mailbox one and two. Um, in this case, this EWS app is not using cookies at all. So it's just sending EWS requests, they hit the load balancer, could be round robin or just completely random, however the load balancer chooses to do it. Um, they're just, it's just spraying the requests all over the place, which is fine. So you're getting maximum load balance. Um, but if these dotted lines here represent RP, RPCs on the back end, so you, you have, for any given request, you have a, the first RPC to create a connection and then the next RPC to do the work. So you, this isn't a specific, you know, this is exactly the number of RPCs that you're saving, but the idea here is that there's, there's more RPCs involved when you are hitting a mailbox, or hitting a CAS server asking for data from a mailbox for the first time. It's gonna maintain, it's gonna create this connection um, and then do the work. So in this case, there's, there's more RPC traffic per that unit of work than if we did this uh, scenario, which is to send one cookie with all three of these EWS requests to the load balancer. They all have the same cookie, so they all go to the same CAS. Um, then, you know, we'll say they're all for the same mailbox. I create one connection and then I do three work items and I get a response back. So I'm actually saving, uh, finding some efficiencies in getting to the same CAS server. Um, than I, than I would if I spread the load out um, across every server in the array. Now, where I start to lose that efficiency is when I have, let's say, um, the blue lines are for one mailbox that I'm accessing, um, mailbox one, and the, and the orange lines here are for EWS requests that are trying to access mailbox two. Um, these could be on the same or different mailbox servers. It doesn't really matter. Um, the, and then I'm using the same cookie for both. So I'm going, um, I'm basically sending all of my requests through the same CAS server, um, regardless of the mailbox that I'm trying to access. So I'm basically putting all of the load on this one CAS server. With these orange lines, I could get a little bit more efficiency uh, if I use a separate cookie per mailbox. And then I'm using CAS1 for this mailbox access, using CAS2 for that. 
mailbox access. Now, now I'm getting the balance of per mailbox. I'm getting that efficiency of, of that cache connection to the given mailbox I'm accessing, but I'm not asking, asking one CAS server to do all the work uh, for my application. And then again, any kind of throttling that's being enforced between my EWS app and a CAS server is now balanced between these two. So the work I'm doing with CAS1 is throttled under one set of budgets. The work that I'm doing against CAS2 is a separate, you know, is, is, is a clean, I have a clean slate when I get to that box. Um, so those, the throttling budgets on the work handling, um, handled by both those CAS servers uh, is completely separate. So what does that mean? So in general, you want to use one cookie per mailbox. So per unit of work that you're doing against any given mailbox, you get a cookie back. Maintain that cookie associated with that unit of work for that mailbox. And then um, send that cookie with any request for that mailbox. And here's the note about the EWS Manage API. That makes it easy. Um, the Exchange Service object handles that for you. So all of that just kind of happens unbeknownst to you. What it's doing is the Exchange service, service object will receive the cookie from the response, peel it off, and then send it with any subsequent requests. So the way you use the managed API, you create an instance of the Exchange Service object, and then you send requests with that one instance. That one instance will always send the same cookie. So what you do is you instantiate a new Exchange Service object per uh, mailbox that you're accessing. And we talked a little bit yesterday about the managed API um, in that it's not thread safe. So you kind of, you don't want to, the exchange service object doesn't have any kind of connection or anything like that, um, like Mappy, like Mappy would anyway. So it's very lightweight to create new instances of that object. So you really want to um, basically associate an instance of the exchange service object equivalent to uh, the scope of one cookie, um, in this case, one mailbox that you're accessing. Any questions about that? Does that answer your question? It does. Do you, can, you, can you still get the cookie if you have to go to the metal? Yeah. So you can, even from the exchange service object, so the question was, can you manipulate that cookie through the exchange service object? You can get the collection of cookies, and you could strip it off or add one uh, if you had a different scenario where you needed to add a cookie. So yeah, actually, you, know, you could go in if you wanted to reuse the same service object. Um, but not reuse the cookie. You could go in, pull the, go into the cookie collection, remove it, and then ensure that the next request goes out with no cookie um, or a different cookie if you wanted. So there are sometimes um, where you may want to to bend the rules here. So when you know when I said, you know, we're tying, uh, we're associating a cookie with the unit of work against the mailbox, and we're making sure that it goes to the same CAS. Um, there may be situations that even for one mailbox, you're doing a massive amount of work. Uh, maybe that's a migration scenario um, or a backup scenario. And so you don't want one CAS server to get pinged with all of the requests that you're sending up to migrate mail um, into, a, into a specific mailbox server. Um, so you want to spread that out, even though it's, even though it's um, maybe one mailbox that you're importing 100 items into. You want to do 25 per CAS server or something like that. Um, that would allow you to get better throughput overall um, and balance the workload. So in that case, you might take you know what we just discussed about managing cookies and how that relates to Affinity, um, and kind of work that into your uh, scenario if you have large workloads. Next thing we're going to talk about is subscriptions and notifications, which are a very stateful um, part of EWS, um, and so we really have to keep this in mind. Um, the notion of affinity and manage that well. So um, we talked about this a little bit. So this is um, the blue line here is the subscribe request. So that's the first request we make that had no cookie on it. Um, we would get a cookie back from that. But if then we didn't submit that cookie um, with the get events request, these orange lines, and we got the load balancer sends us to a different CAS server, those requests are going to fail unless we randomly end up back at uh, CAS1 where the subscription actually lives. So without managing affinity, it's really hard to, to know or be sure that, uh, that subscriptions and notifications are going to work. So what you want to do is you get your cookie back from the subscribe request, and you use that same cookie for all your subsequent Git events or Git streaming events requests that come back. So you go back to the same CAS server, which has the table of, uh, of your subscriptions that are active on that CAS server. 
you may do this for one unit of subscriptions that you're maintaining. So you have one unit of work monitoring, you know, a couple hundred mailboxes, um, and then you have another. And the next couple hundred mailboxes may have a different cookie, and you have affinity with another CAS server. Um, but per essentially like a bundle of subscriptions that you're doing in a Git events request, uh, you want to make sure you go back to the server that's uh, maintaining all of those active subscriptions. So I just talked about this first bullet here. Um, so all of the subscribe, unsubscribe, get events, get streaming events, operations, they need to go to the same CAS server. Um, cookies will ensure that that happens. Um, in most cases, and we'll look at this in the next diagram, you're going to do subscriptions, and then you're going to get events back, and then you're going to react to them. So you're going to do a get events call, you're going to do some kind of sync folder items or something. Um, so you want to you want to manage and look at how am I going to blend my mailbox access cookie management with the subscription uh, requirements for Affinity um, into my implementation. And so you need to kind of consider them both equally and, and plan for that. So the, the first look is if I said, hey, I'm subscribing to this one, uh, to this one mailbox, the subscriptions on this CAS server, I get a cookie back, and then I'm going to use that for all of my get events calls. And then when I react to those get events, I'll take that same subscription and call sync folder items, whatever, um, and do all of that with the same cookie. Well, then you're back into the state where you're asking the same CAS server to do all of the work. It's, it's sending all of the notifications back. It's doing all the synchronization, handling all of the operations. So you're basically going to wear out this CAS server in that case. You're also going to put yourself in a good, uh, you know, have a good chance to be throttled. So the best way to do this is to intelligently manage your cookies and separate your logic of your subscriptions versus your mailbox access. So your EWS app now kind of breaks out and has one unit that's, that's keeping track of subscriptions. It may be a separate process, maybe just a separate set of threads. Um, it's, it's basically managing the subscriptions and the affinity required for subscriptions. Um, and then could also be kind of populating a queue on the client side or something of of work that needs to be done, which is picked up by your mailbox access um, threads, which then are using separate cookies per mailbox to go out and do the work. So you have the required affinity for subscriptions where needed. Then you have the affinity to give you uh, efficiencies per mailbox that you're accessing. Um, but you're also spreading the load out as best you can amongst all the servers in the array. So you're getting the full benefit of every server in the CAS array. Um, this, this kind of model is critical for Exchange Online, where we have tight throttling policy restrictions, um, we're managing a multi-tenant service, um, so you know, these CAS servers are under a little bit more stress than maybe an enterprise environment. Um, they're servicing multiple different tenants, and so what you need to do is make sure that you're spreading the load out and getting efficiencies and maintaining state where needed. Um, and so this is really the only way you're going to be able to scale and monitor, uh, you know, a large organization level uh, mailboxes um, at any given time in Exchange Online. Any questions about that? So just to recap that diagram, so the best practice here is combine the affinity models. Um, we kind of talked about all this. So Store a unique cookie for each subscription or bundle of subscriptions. Store a unique cookie for each uh, mailbox that you're accessing. Um, and, and make sure you're balancing load while assuring uh, affinity where needed. And that's all I've got. It's, um, any questions here? We're, we've ended a little early, so I'll, you know, I'll definitely open it up to any questions that you have on this topic or anything else at this point. That's it. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you.